keynote session sponsor, Stemilt. I think what makes us unique is we've been growing in Washington for three generations now. So we grow uh, peaches, nectarines, growing organic, the consumer wants organic. Columbia Basin, it's a great climate. We have great water, deep sandy loam soils. The thing I'm most proud of as a farmer is when I give fruit away to friends and family and they say, this is the best fruit I've ever eaten. That's when I know as a farmer, I'm doing things right. And now, three industry leaders are bringing their crystal ball to the conversation. The future of grocery retailing through the eyes of those committed to innovation, the shopping experience, and the growth of organics. Jeff Cady, Director of Produce and Floral at Topps Markets. Michael Schutt, Director of Produce and Floral for Rayleigh's. Leading the discussion is principal of Stonewall Rob Advisors and former co-CEO of Whole Foods, Walter Rob. Supply chain issues, the role of technology and e-commerce, consumer shopping behavior, new formats and innovations in grocery retailing. It's all on the table. Let's get into it. Walter Rob kicks things off. How's everybody doing? We're all the stands between you and lunch, I think. Right? So you mentioned uh, on the introductions that we had, uh, we had, uh, first of all, fantastic presentation on the uh, plastic bottles and a fantastic job. Congratulations on that. Awesome. Uh, so is there a new normal? Uh, this morning what we want to do is talk about the future of grocery retailing and how we're going to serve the customers in the future. And uh, to do that, we've got our esteemed panel here. I'll give you the headline, which is physical stores matter. The digital evolution is going to accelerate. Uh, the customers continue to evolve with the new and new demands. And it is going to take relationships between the suppliers and the retailers in order to solve and meet those needs. That's the headline. And we'll, we'll come back around to that at the end. But uh, let me, uh, we're going to do this together with our, our panel, which, by the way, in all, in all transparency, we put together in the last 24 hours. Because COVID took a toll on our previous panel. So bear with us as we're kind of making this up as we go along. So I'd like to introduce you to our fourth panelist, who is uh, a good friend, Edmund Lamarckia. No stranger to this produce community, as he is the uh, father and mother of Whole Foods Market Produce Program and has been uh, built it from the ground up. And so obviously knows a lot about and knows a lot of you. So it's good to see a lot of you here. Thanks for being with us, and Edmund, thank you for being with us as well. So we thought we might start the conversation uh, with, uh, uh, no one wants to talk so much more about COVID, but COVID nonetheless was a very profound time these last couple of years. We learned a lot about ourselves, right? We learned, uh, uh, I think you all could probably come up with one realization of what, what happened to you with COVID, but whether it was that you appreciated food more, or whether you appreciated your wellness more, or whether you appreciated your grocer more, which we love that one. Um, that, uh, so we want to start out kind of with a question for each of you, which is that what did you take away from the COVID period that will help you think about, uh, take yourself into the future? So, uh, Edmund, would you like to go first? Um, well, the big, one, the big one for me was the transfer of food purchasing from the groceries, from the food service industry to the grocery stores. As a 38-year re, thir organic retailer, um, it was the first time I ever considered myself a hero. And, and I also, as somebody who really thinks food is the, is the key element to wellness and health, um, when you cook at home, when you cook your own food, it's, it's beneficial for you. And we had this golden opportunity to seize the moment and change the paradigm. And to me, that was the biggest learning in COVID. And it's going on as we speak. Good. Michael? I'd like to apologize in advance just for a, a small sidebar. And I know, Walter, you, you charted a really, uh, a really great course for us today. Um, but I feel the need that we, we start the day with some gratitude. Um, I like that. You know, um, when Coach Matt Seeley looked down the bench, and he looked deep down the bench, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he calls your number, um, and you get the opportunity to, to step on the court 
or in this manner, step on the, on the stage with what you consider to be the, the goat or the Le LeBron of, of, our, of our industry, then you sprint to the court and you, you pray you don't uh, throw up any air balls. <laughs> I don't know about that yet. Well, we're, we're st the jury's still out on that. So, um, so what do we have? We probably have a thousand people between the room and the remote that, mm -hmm. that we're speaking to today. I'd be hard pressed to find one of you that wasn't, that hasn't benefited, that hasn't been influenced or inspired by the work that these two gentlemen have done for our industry. I digress, you asked me a question. <laughs> that wasn't an air ball though, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice job. What did we learn? Um, you know, what, to Edmund's what did point. You learn, what did you learn that you're gonna take forward? I mean, we all lived through it, we all have our experiences of it, but so how is it gonna inform how you take yourself forward to the point before is really, it's really about what's coming down the road. We're talking about what does grocery retail look like, you know, two, three years from now. So what did you experience that's gonna help you, you know, be, you know, take your program forward? I know there's a lot of different determining factors of what the future looks like, economics being one of them, inflation, logistics. But I do believe that there's some tackiness to what we've experienced with COVID. And the tackiness, what I, I'm referring to, is the food events taking place in the home. And those weren't just dinners and family dinners and, ha and, the fam and all the byproduct of that, the conversations that come around that. Right. But that was the cafeteria for the, for the kids that were doing you know, school at home. That was you know, for when I was at home, that was my cafeteria for, for my office lunches when I came down from the second floor. I think some of that will stay with us. And so we have the onus put on us to really make sure that we're still engaging in that business. People are eating again, cooking is cool again, being in, being in the grocery store is cool again. So staying connected to that customer, um, that's, that's certainly something we have to pull forward. Um, I think the second thing, the, one of the biggest things, and we've been speaking about this for, for some time, is wherever you were as a, as a retailer on your arc of, of uh, click and collect or delivery or your digital platform, it got accelerated. And it got accelerated to the point of everybody saw Star Wars, the 77 version, when you get in the Millennium Falcon and they push hyperspeed and the stars come at you like this. That's, that's what we all experienced. You had to accelerate your digital platform. And we now know that that's, that's something that's here. And the generation that's, that, that will start to age up in their buying power, the, the Zs, Xs, double As, what, whatever letters we get after that, they're already engaged in that. They're going to meet us there. We have to continue down that path. That's great, okay. How about for you, Jeff? So much of what he said is true for sure. I, I go to uh, the supply chain piece of it and knowing that there's a, a second, third, fourth gear, we were able to put it into overdrive. Uh, for, the, for the longest time, trying to uh, establish relationships with suppliers to make sure that we're in, in the best position you know, with the supply and uh, quality produce and being able to tap into that during our time of need and everybody rising to the occasion, what I, what I really felt I learned almost established that yes, I'm, I'm on the right path. It, it is about relationships and, and we all came together and flipped it into overdrive and, and we fed the people. And the other thing I learned is that I, I and that I'm gonna take forward is that what we do is, is an admirable job. It, it's in heroes and I've heard all those words and putting credibility back into the, uh, into the stores and what those folks do every day. I, I think that's great. I think uh, I, I'm very happy that that uh, is gonna stick on. I know it will. And the only other thing I would say uh, that I would take from it would be from a merchandising perspective because again, it wasn't utopia. Obviously we were challenged with, with supply throughout the, uh, the COVID, but uh, again, getting it in, but we were able to bob and weave, uh, keep uh, customer centric, try to make sure we had solutions for their problems. And maybe it wasn't the grade they wanted, maybe it wasn't the exact variety they wanted, but we all, we all pulled together and we put food for the folks. Yeah. There's no question about it. I think the, the grocers really showed their resiliency, right? I mean, the grocery store never closed. Uh, had, who, nobody figured out those plastic screens, you know, uh, that, that all showed up all of a sudden. All that stuff got figured out on the fly. Mm -hmm. And the grocers deserve a lot of credit for being able to be able to make that adjustment and continue to serve their customers through a very challenging time. I do think one that, that I would call out is just the, the appreciation for your, your personal health and wellness. I think people became a lot more attuned to that during that period of time. And uh, obviously I've got a, a point of view on that with Whole Foods, but 
Um, but I do think that that is going to stay with us, is staying with us, because the younger generation is really thinking about well-being and wellness. And I do think that that, that, uh, that awareness that came, uh, you can't take your health for granted. You cannot take your health for granted. You've got to lean into that. And so the question is going to be, how will the produce industry, which, which has a massive platform, which is, I think, said it is the most popular department, right? It is the platform. It's the, in, in Whole Foods stores, it's the one that we lead with in terms of the layout. It's a massive platform that's going to be tomorrow's pharmacy, no question about it. And so the wellness, and one other one I would bring up is just food safety, which is, I think, that we didn't really talk so much, or we were talking about it, or get lip service to food safety. But all of a sudden, the, there was no more bulk bins. There was no more food service. There was no more, there was a concern about food safety. Packaging came back into play. And so that is certainly going to be, that food safety concern is certainly going to play its way forward as well, too. So, um, okay, and then before we jump into the future, a second question for you really has to do with kind of where we find ourselves now. Um, you could argue whether the pandemic is over or not, right? Because there's still the, the new variant that's running around and catching some people caught some of our panelists, but um, really the nine and a half percent inflation had, you know, a headline the other day, um, and the, the the cost of fuel and the cost of, uh, of so forth of commodities in the economy. Um, what are you What are you experiencing right now uh, that you that you are you know that you're experiencing that you think will inform your your next steps forward? So why don't you go first, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so we're experiencing now is, is uh, again, a slight decline in units for sure, right? Sales are up, that's, that's for sure. Uh, c customers are still engaged in the department. Uh, they're still holding on to those, those gains. They, they, re they still remember that, that oranges have vitamin C and kiwi has you know, vitamin C. They know all that stuff and, and they're still going to it. They're still buying turmeric and ginger roots and all those things. And our goal is just to keep putting that out in front just trying to stay customer centric, trying to make sure that it's easy and, and as affordable as possible. We're unable to pass on every penny of increase. We cannot do it. We're not going to do it. We have to make sure the stuff turns in store. This isn't, this isn't a widget, can of soup or anything like that. So, you know, we're investing, but it's okay. We're, we're good. We've been moving forward. And uh, that, that's how I see it. So you, uh, you experienced some, some margin compression then? Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure uh -huh. we are. Yeah, but again, it's, you know, again, it's a yin and yang. I mean, again, we had a couple of great years where the meat department was having all kinds of issues, and now maybe produce has to write, and, and it will, and then it'll go back. So uh, I, I'm just, I, I think it's just a, a blip on the screen, but I think that we're, you know, we're poised to, to move it forward, and, and we'll make sure we get our, our, our margins back while making sure product turns at store level. That's Do you have a recent example of that that you, that you could share? As far as the, the price compression and the decision that you had to make and so forth and how you think that will To try to play call out, uh, so I'll, I'll go to the, one of the number one categories in the department. It'd be salads. It's, it's a big part. It's a big part of what we do. Uh, costs have been coming fast and furious. For those, those of you, you know, you all know all the inputs or what's happening. And we have only gone up small. We have to keep turning that case. It's too, it's too critical for us. We have to keep turning the case. So we've just really kept the pedal to the metal on that. Again, there was some supply, some supply issues early on, but to that, the ship is righted for us. And uh, we just kind of stayed the course there. We keep pushing it. We know it's important. And again, for organic salads, all of it. So, and uh, that, that's really what we've done. In fact, I, I've almost gone the opposite way, and I'm starting to, to, to create that, that extra tier, that tier up, so to speak. And, uh, and that's been pretty successful for us, too. So. Yeah. I do think it really points out the need for partnership between the suppliers and the retailers, this idea, because I've been talking to Jeff at uh, Grimway last night and you know, his costs on fuel and fertilizer and, and packaging are going up daily or weekly. And these are real costs that they're experiencing, right? And they're coming to you uh, saying, hey, I've got these costs, I've got to take price. And then how that discussion plays out is a tension that's happening right now with the inflation of 9.5% and not yet clear. Uh, where it's going, um, these are going to be real issues for the next, uh, at least next year, for sure, in any case. So, Michael, what about for you? What are you experiencing right now that, uh, that's kind of informing how you're thinking about going forward? I think now more than ever, retailers, they have to deliver on their value proposition. You know, price is what you pay, value is what you get, and, is ex and experience is what you extract mm -hmm. from that. Um, no longer just selling goods as we did in the height of COVID, mm -hmm. you know, plugging holes on the shelf to, to stay, have some kind of um, continuity of business for the customer. That's no longer going to be, you know, acceptable. We'll have to lean back in on the pillars that got us here and 
on quality and standards and, and things like that uh, for sure. Uh, transparency being elevated as cu customers' consciousness raises on their, on their purchase. Say more about that's an interesting point. Everybody is, everybody is in a different place on their, on their wellness journey. And certainly if they're shopping our department, they have some intersection point on that journey. And as retailers, it's, the onus is really on us, the imperative mm -hmm. is on us to guide them on that. And, and we're, we have so many more opportunities to do that you know, through the platforms available to us in, instead of just talking to Mrs. Smith at Shelf. But getting back to the point of the guidance, it's imperative that we are walking with our customers down that path, maybe slightly ahead as we guide them, um, but being cognizant to not drag them. And I think that that's a, that's a very delicate dance to do. That's good. I just want to, I want to pick up on that point, which is that your evolution of consciousness. I think if you look back, John gave us a little bit of history, but I think if you look back in the 70s when the natural food thing was really born, uh, there was this burst of awareness or consciousness about the, the idea of moving from processed foods to whole foods, right? And uh, what you're kind of saying is we're at, this, we're at this point now where there's a new burst of consciousness, the Greta generation, to use your point, which has got, which this is exactly where at this, we're at this point, accelerated by COVID, that the consciousness has sprung forward. And that's what I mean by customers now have a new set of demands and needs that need to be met. The only way they're going to be met is by everybody working together. The only way they're going to be met uh, is by partnership and by investment uh, in those relationships. Uh, if we're going to figure out regen, we're going to figure out carbon, we're going to figure out any of these things, soil practices, health, it's going to have to be done as an industry. It can't be done uh, by a single player. But Edmund, over to you, the same question for you in terms of the, what you're experiencing right now. Well, uh, I'll, I'll speak. I know you're a, you're a regular shopper of like you're still right. well, going to all gonna, the stores. I'm going to start with on the heels of COVID, we're at a really... Um, Wonderful point to use this as an opportunity. What, what I mean by that is it, it costs somewhere in the area of 20% less to eat at home than it does to eat out. So taking advantage of that in this period of time is a great opportunity for, for retailers. So I got one more point, which is back in 2008, when we had the Great Recession, um, you know, we at Whole Foods benefited from that in a way that the rest of the marketplace didn't. And that's because we invested heavily into our values and our mission and we push the hell out of organics. And I think that the grocery industry is poised right now to take advantage of that. I like both what I heard from Jeff and Michael in terms of values and dexterity and merchandising. And, and, and it might be a time to eat a little bit of margin, but you're going to get it on the top end at this point. Your, your margins are always higher when your average retail is a little bit higher. Your margin dollars, not your percent, but your margin dollars. So. Oh, I, got, I do want to just second Walter's point about the multi-stakeholder point of view. It's got to be win-win-win for everybody, the supplier, the customer, the environment. Um, it's like everybody's got to win in this one, and that's going to be the retailer who comes out on the end. Okay, great. So, um, again, we said we're making this up as we go along here, so stay with us, and thank you for your patience and events for just being 100% transparent with you. But. Uh, we're going to talk, we're going to pivot now kind of the future, which is, that, as I see it, as we see it, I think, is meeting the customer where they are, when, when they want to be met, how they want to be met, which is kind of the purpose of the first conversation as well. And so we're going to look at that through the lens of four different areas, the first one being omnichannel. So Edmund, you want to take that away? Yeah, first of all, I want to appreciate John for such an outstanding presentation on omnichannel. I think he clarified a lot of the things we all struggle with in, in his visual presentation slide. Um, I'm going to start with a quote from Madavi Reese, who was supposed to be here. She's a marketing vice president from Whole Foods, because I thought it was extremely, um, it was extremely relevant, and, and, and I agree with it. In the future, online will be, the, the people who win online will be the people who curate the best. Curation is king. So if you're online, you definitely have to pay a lot of attention to what you're putting out there. In store, it's going to be in instant access. That will be the norm. And that's, we're a long way from that at this point, but that's got to be the goal for retail going forward in this on the channel environment. And to be clear, instant access looks like you walk up, you got a, you got a delicata and a butternut squash, you got a QR code you can scan with your phone, that, that, and you can determine right away which one you're going to use, right? So it's got to be instant information, uh, is what you mean by that, right? 
A absolutely, and being able to get out of the store quickly and um, having all the codes in the front end. And, and uh, I would also say that being able to do a click and collect when you're in the store and get it the next day, you know, that, that quick turnaround on things that aren't in stock, because we're all going to struggle with in stock. And, and as a customer becomes more diverse, we're going to have a harder time meeting their needs in the four walls. But if we can get outside the four walls and get it back really fast, that wins. Yeah, by the way, by the way, I was just thinking that, you know, click and collect, I mean, that, those things didn't really exist back in 2018, 2019. We were 3% we were digitally penetrated in 2019. We're, I saw the numbers this morning. We're at 13% now, with some people predicting 20% by 2025. I don't know what you think, John, but I don't think it's going to get that high. There's a chance of maybe overbuilding it. But, We've gone from 3% to 13% in just three years in terms of digital penetration. So the pivot to delivery and pickup uh, is something that happened in COVID and accelerated, and it's here to stay. Absolutely. I think there's one more point that Madavi wanted to make that I completely agree with, is the way we communicate with customers and the way we message them has to be catered towards the channel, and it has to be catered towards what they're actually interested in. So that profiling. Um, that, that loyalty program, that affinity, has got to be sharpened up a, a considerably more than it, as it, than it exists at this moment. Um, I also want to put a little bit of a word of caution out there, because if we don't do these things, if the retailer and the produce industry doesn't do the things that need to be done, the online marketplace could absolutely be commoditized and become a price marketplace, and it could cost us sales. So it, it is an urgency that I speak to you right now. I see this as something that needs to evolve in a material way over the next three to five years. We got the big push, the Millennial Falcon, we got that, <laughs> but we got to keep going, and we got to keep going hard. Yeah, and John's numbers are interesting because he says that the online shoppers buy on more produce online, but most of the numbers show across the, across the country the online shoppers buy on 50% less produce online than they are in store. Why is that? When you go and do your online shopping experience, and you did it the other day, you scroll through it, it's not, it's not that exciting. It's hard to do discovery. It's hard to kind of really, you know, you can't get the taste and the texture and the feeling and that sort of thing. And so what Edmund is saying, and I really agree with it, is that, th and this is what I mean, is there's going to be a huge investment and acceleration of this experience, which has to be done again through partnership in order to be able to give the customer what they want, which is essentially they want the in-store, on they want the store online is what they want. We're a long way from that right now, a long right, well, way from that. When, when this panel was set up, we had people that were more focused on marketing. We have the luxury today, and, and it plays to my heartthrob, of having operators. So what I'd like to ask you guys is, you know, what are you seeing with your experiences with the online community and, and sort of the, the cross, I would call it cross-channel at this point. I don't know that we're omni-channel in, in our marketplaces, but what are you guys seeing, and what would you like to see improved to move this thing forward in the future? I can jump right in. Yeah. The, it's, again, we lost the impulse, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, there, there is, when you have the in-store experience, you're walking in, you're smelling that honeydew, you're all those things. That, that needs to improve. We can't just, it just can't be a box of Cheerios check. It can't be that. It, somehow we have to, how do we, how do we reach a customer? How do we be more customer centered? The, all the, the affinity items and, and learn from what the customer's clicking on, right? All those things that are gonna happen. That's not there. That's not there right now. And if it is, we, we don't have it uh, readily available, at least in, in, in uh, the Buffalo market. And I, and I think there's a lot of sales left on the table. Uh, so hopefully we can get that fixed. The, the experience just should be better. You can put goggles on. I should be able to be able to walk up, put some gloves on, grab that thing, do what they, right, you scratch and sniff. I, I don't know. They're, I mean, come on, that, that's what it is. The Duplicate metaverse. the in-store yeah. experience. Yeah. I think you just made an ad for Facebook right there. Yeah. <laughs> meta, whatever. So, Michael? I'd say, you know, my response to that is that, you know, pre-COVID, Click and Collect was our primary incubator. So we're really, you know, COVID put us into our infancy, and we're trying to, you know, get our feet under us and really do our best as a retailer, because I think the onus is to we have to replicate that brick and mortar experience. As best our ability, we have to do that. And the way we win is to highly personalize that experience. And are you doing that at Rayleigh's now, or? We're, we're working towards it every day, absolutely. You have to, and, and finding where you're going to meet, the, meet your customer. You know, version 1.0 was, was print ad, or it was radio, or right. it, TV, if you had the budget. That's my, probably not us. You know, Next, next go around, you know, certainly is going to be is, is a little bit more digital. Maybe that's uh, the vehicle is through rewards type based program, but 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0, 3.0,
3.5, that is absolutely going to be social based. Yeah. Again, John's uh, model of the cross channel is really an example. Yeah. It's, not, it's no longer just going this way. It's moving all these different directions simultaneously. I just wanted to make a point about the customer, though, because um, it's, there's not one customer. The customer right now in the market, there's four generations of customers. There's the boomer, millennial, the X, and the, the Zer, right? And each of those, if you look at the data on them, have different consideration sets for when they make their purchase. And so um, particularly the younger customers skewing much more towards the wellness, sustainability, uh, those sorts of concerns that were just, were just spoken about. And um, so it's really good to remember that. And then from a Whole Foods perspective, when you look at the motivation of the customer, there's at least three, and, and I'm sure it's different for you guys, but uh, one is just value. People want to have a fair price. Number two is they want something that is going to help them to be healthier. And number three, it's values-based. And increasingly, and I do talks at business schools, what I'm hearing from customers is that they want to do business with brands that are aligned with the way they, they think about the world. Not just do they have the honey melon, honeydew melon in, in stock, but does this company show up? Uh, does this company show up in a way that's aligned with how I'm thinking about it? In talking with Jeff again last night, he told me, at Grimway, he told me that he's got uh, is number one of the number one things he's spending time on is on the ESG concerns. We'll talk about it later, but uh, that this is something where it really supports this idea that the customer, the new customer, and and, you know, and Whole Foods over 60% of the, of the team members are now millennials. So this thing has really shifting, and it's shifting very fast. And if you're not moving with it, you're moving it at your own peril. So um, in any case, the, the omni-channel thing, the cross-channel, whatever you want to call it, I think the, you identified the big opportunity, Edmund, which is really that if you don't move with that, if you don't start moving with that and invest against that, which is going to happen, uh, you're going to fall behind your competitors, right? And it's going to take all of us together. If you're going to represent your produce product up on the platform with the retailer, how do we do that in a way that communicates the transparency of that, whether it's through in-store, whether it's through digital, whether it's through in any channel at all. And the fact is also we have new channels in market that didn't exist before five years ago. We have a very robust D to C uh, where people can start companies and products. We have, uh, we have the uh, quick commerce movement, which is now growing very quickly, which delivers within 10 minutes. This didn't exist five years ago. Uh, and we have you know, very robust online only grocers that didn't exist before. So, and people like Misfits and uh, uh, the product and companies like this, which are op offering products. So there's many more ways for a product to get to market. And uh, these customers have many, many different uh, motivations in terms of their shopping habits. And let's go to the second lens that we were going to use, Edmund, if we could. Yeah, uh, and Walter set it up perfectly because what we're seeing is sustainability and wellness are converging and, and to a major concern for consumers. An FMI study last year, two, 2021, stated that 96% of consumers consider produce an investment in their wellness and, and their health. Um, I, I was staggered by that. And then within that 96%, six out of 10 of them are buying specific products for specific health um, considerations. Kiwi for vitamin C. Um, now, contrast that within 2017, Google did a query of their customer, or they did a report on their customer queries uh, around food, and you know, organic was number one that showed up, and, and then underneath that, with a pretty significant decline, was functional food and superfoods. So we've come a long way with, or food is medicine, we've come a long way with our consumers and making them feel like produce is a good decision. Um, I think, I think it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. And I'd really like to hear from you guys talking about how you see it from a purchasing and a merchandising standpoint. Like how, how are you going to have to evolve your systems to take that consumer's concern about wellness? I think that's going to be one of our competitive advantages particularly when you look at institutions and the challenges that they have presenting nutritional information at the point of sale. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, yeah I'll jump in. Um, I think that, I, I, I cited this earlier, but really you guys help set the stage for better for you shopping experience. And, you know, retailers like us have tried to follow in, in that cadence. And, uh, you know, the elimination of, of things you know, on this, on this wellness journey. You know, we, we removed sugary snacks from the check stands. That's, that's no longer an option. We offer fruit to kids when they enter the store. We no longer sell tobacco products. This health thing has kind of been on our leadership's mind for, for a long time, marching toward a, a very consistent, 
mantra of changing the way the world eats one plate at a time. And we've never deviated from that path. And so this has all been our, been our own journey to offer better things for the overall health of our customers that enter the store. That's great, Jeff. I continue to try to give customers what they want, fish where the customers are at. That's why I say fish where the fish are at, right? That's what you do. So people come in, it was COVID, they all come in, they all know the healthy foods, they know what they are, they still know it today. There was, there was no mystery here, we just got to continue, we just continue to try to, to, to push that message forward and make sure that it's uh, readily available at the, at the shelf uh, and, and just continue to try to, 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 to educate the consumer on all the other great things that we're doing, you know, to sustainability. I know we talk about, you know, where wellness meets it. It's that same customer, right? The same customer that's buying organic. Organics sold more, right? I mean, it was all those things. Everybody, everybody, they're well aware of it. It's just funny how when you get called to the mat, all of a sudden, you know it, you figure it out in a hurry, and all of a sudden, ginger root is up 500% because it's, it's healthy and it, and it's still, and still, you know, the, it's, that's where it's at today. So we'll keep, you know, putting those things in front. We'll keep educating the, uh, the consumers with all the great, you know, socially responsible things we're doing. It's the same folks we're talking to and the ones who don't care, don't care. And the ones who do, and there's a lot more every day, like you're saying, every day, more and more, uh, we'll, we'll continue to make sure they have that information. We need your help, but yeah. I'm going to make a bold prediction that in five years that food and medicine are going to join. Uh, you're already seeing this with the formation of uh, biofoods or foods that have their companies that are discovering the compounds within food that are tied directly to chronic disease. Um, you are going to start this. You're going to see uh, this on package. You're going to begin to see personalized diets experience. This will all come online as well as uh, in store. So these two worlds are going to converge in the next five years because of the pace of science and data that's happening right now. And again, so. If you're, um, you know, if you put broccoli in, in, if you put the broccoli sprouts in a dish with uh, cancer cells, the cancer cells die. So they know that now, right? So, so you can see that the active uh, phenols that are in broccoli or in other products, these things are going to start to come out and be merchandised. And so the, the supermarket's going to evolve as a pharmacy, really, is what's going to happen. This wellness thing is real, and people are thinking, I mean, the, the statistics are very clear from IRI and others that... People are seeking well-being and wellness in their purchase choice, particularly the younger generation. They don't want to just live to be. The definition of, of, of um, by the way, the def definition of health for the American Medical Association is the absence of disease. But the definition of health for younger people is the presence of vitality, right? And so the way to do that is through food. And they've shown that food is far more effective than, than supplements. And I'm saying that as someone who used to sell a lot of supplements. But food's far more effective in terms of the delivery system. And so Protus is the largest platform in the world for change, for cre creating healthy change. The largest one in the world. No question about it. So I think I, we're speaking at an organic conference. And, and it's, it should come as no surprise that organic is part of the key of how we merchandise and market to our customers and, and push for health. 54% um, of the millennials are still buying more organics than they bought before COVID. That we didn't see a decline as started, people started eating out more. And I think that organic is the cornerstone. But to the points that Walter made and, and some of the merchandising points that were made, um, we have to add more information to it. And, and that's going to become the challenge for us in the future. It's right. going to be essential. Um, and we're seeing functional foods in that type of labeling show up in the marketplace, but we're going to need to push even harder because superfoods and functional foods don't really have a standard, and yet they're going to become really important as we look at things like heart health and, and um, healthy fats. So again, on our, on our mission here to cover kind of uh, the future of food retailing and um, the four areas that we're looking at in terms of meeting the customer where they're going to be, where they're at, the third one is really the quality standards, Edmund. So do you want to take that area? You want to oh, move, love, this, I, move this along? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I love quality standards. As a, a, you know, I think one of the great things we did at Whole Foods Market is we got bigger, we stepped further into our, our mission, which meant we could invest in quality standards. I am a, IRI data, to Walter's point, identifies that consumers want more transparency, but particularly millennial and Gen Z consumers are demanding broad spectrum transparency. Well, I mean, organics is certainly the cornerstone of that, but emerging things like, um, like uh, uh, Regen or uh, ESG, and I think ESG is a powerful one because so many companies are starting to look at it, and I, I don't mean to diminish Regen, I'm a big fan of the concept, but um, ESG is taking root in more companies throughout the spectrum of, of our business, but it's 
lacking in definition and it's lacking in structure. So we're gonna have to look at that and say how are we going to marry organics with ESG to cover the, spe the broad spectrum of what the emerging consumer really wants to see. And again, I'd say three to five years, maybe 10 at most, we're gonna have to have a really solid solution for that. We're seeing a lot of unrest in the consumers because we don't have labor standards and things of that nature. Yeah. So we're really, we're really talking about social responsibility because we had 60 cycles of, so of topsoil left. That was referenced in the regen session this morning. 60 cycles of topsoil left. That's real. And we've got, uh, we have concerns about labor. We've got concerns about climate. We've got concerns about uh, health. So the, these concerns, the, at least the customers, the young customers I talk to, they're, this is what's on their mind. It's what's helping them to make their decisions where to shop and what to buy. So you were going to go to the operators? Yeah, I think for the operators, I mean, I, as a guy who was at the beginning of organics and retail, um, you know, I, we were always looking for help. And, you guys are operators, you're front lines. Who are you looking for to help you with social accountability and, and, and sort of addressing the ESG kind of mandate that's out there? <laughs> All the folks out here, yeah. that's who I'm looking for. Yeah, that's who we need. They, they bring us the, the, the answers, we help. You know, our goal is to be partners with them and try, and try to help figure and solve the problem. But, but, but certainly we're running stores, we're filling stores up and, and, and you know where our mind's at, but certainly we're not, we're not uh, you know, naive. We, we understand the, you know, the importance of, but we need the information from these folks to bring it to us, give us options, you know, help us understand our customers and what you're seeing. You know, because again, we, we do kind of live in a vacuum. I mean, I'm, I'm in Buffalo, New York. It's, it's a small city, it's not that big. I need to know more, right? So, so I, I need the, the help from the folks in this room to, to get those messages across. Michael? I wanted to just go back one second to make sure that I fully distilled something that you mentioned about the, the five year and the, and the coalescing and food as medicine. I wanted to make sure I got that really granular. So is it fair to say that the dollar that's in your right pocket today, that if you don't spend that in the produce department, that you put it in your left pocket and give it to your health care provider next week? That's true. Okay, okay go back to the original that's question. That's a great point. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, you, you, we, we, we can keep it moving. The tie me on that yeah. I, I saw a great, a great slide um, from like the 1920s till now, and it's like this is what we used to spend on food, and this is what we used to spend on medicine, and, and this is what we spend on medicine, and this is what we spend on food as a per capita expense. And I, I forgot about it until you just talked about it. Well, then there's a great quote, let, 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 uh, let food be thy medicine, the medicine be thy food. So, but I think the bigger point is that over the next five years, these things are going to converge. And for the grocer and for the produce producer, uh, there's huge opportunity there. And I think really the point of this panel was to kind of outline some, of, you know, sketch out some of these areas where I think there are opportunity for you to grow into. It's going to take partnership. It's going to take investment. It's going to take effort. It's going to take focus. But you've got to look out. Uh, and, and you've, got to be, you've got to be investing in the future, what, which is what, kind of what we're talking about. So the, the last area we had to kind of share with you was around the area of, of innovation. So um, did I catch you by surprise? Yeah, you got you. Okay. Sorry. Well, um, I, I, I'm going to turn it back to Walter because he's the guy who should be talking about a lot of the best things happening in store format, shopping carts. Um, but I will say that uh, packaging and... and uh, but I will say that I am really excited about the uh, idea of innovating for flavor. I think that that's a really interesting innovation because we have so many great ideas out there, like, like snack peppers. Um, but you know, some of the snack peppers leave a little bit to be desired in terms of the eating quality. And the idea that we can, through innovation, particularly between um, seed and, and varietal production, we can um, find better flavor that holds up to the marketplace to induce um, volume of consumption. Um, I think that's one of the things that I'm most excited to see in the future. But I'm going to turn it back to you because I think the things that are really exciting in, in the innovative area are some of the store formatting things that, you know, and you're one of the all-time great store designers in, in, well, in the retail sector. I don't know about that, but, but I think, you know, John mentioned what is new is what new, but, you know, there are, there are basically new, new store formats that are coming out. The, uh, obviously, you know, the uh, just walk out uh, technology uh, from Amazon, which is, uh, there's a bunch of those stores where you can shop without, uh, without having to uh, pay at the register. There is uh, the new shopping cart, the Dash Cart, which is going to be coming soon to Whole Foods, where essentially it, uh, it's, 
basically giving you the visual image of the product as you're moving around and tracking you. Obviously, it's getting your data and will allow Amazon to look at you cross-channel as well, right? They'll, they'll be able to match that data with how you're shopping in all the different areas, right? There is, uh, th there's the opportunity for flavor. Uh, there are many companies now working on building in or breeding in uh, both through gene editing and also through regular conventional editing, more flavor in product. And I think that you know, that's going to win in the future marketplace. It's going to be uh, not only those things from a medicinal standpoint, but from a flavor standpoint. So if you can do that, I know Driscoll Berry's been very innovative in doing that with some of their, their new berry varieties. So um, I think the point is simply that the innovation is, uh, you know, it's, it's constant the need to be able to invest in the future in terms of, uh, but are any of you guys, do you, either of you have something you want to share in this area? Yeah, I would say I, I, I love the flavor. Flavor's a big deal. I can sell anything once. I, I, it's a tough if it doesn't eat. It, it needs to eat. So, uh, again, innovation, I see that being a, a big thing. Uh, shelf life, extending shelf life, especially when you're moving stuff from the West Coast to the East Coast. There's so much things being done in that part of innovation. Uh, you know, resp respiration rates of fruit, making sure, all those things. All those things are really cool. And, and you know, we're, I'm actively testing multiple answers for it. My goal is not to like have a museum. My goal is to, to, to sell the produce. <laughs> for the record, yeah. I mean, I don't give the people a feather duster. So, no, we want to move it. But, but it's ultimately, it's important yeah, to try to give that customer the freshest uh, product. So, flavor and uh, I think shelf life. Anything okay. for your innovation, Michael? Uh, I think we've heard a lot about it at, at this conference. And I, I think that we hear about it like it's a new, like it's something new. And I think the version is new. But we, I don't think we can get away from talking about CEA and what controlled environment ag looks like going forward. Granted, it's newer in application when we talk about leafy greens and certainly when we talk about herbs, but I think BC Hothouse started farming under some kind of glass in some kind of medium other than soil in like 73. And now I think everybody in this room has had a TOV. When was the last time you went to an outside field of TOV? I'm going to guess that probably never. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's changed the game and it's going to continue to propel the game. We have a diminishing resource set available to us, especially here in California, even at the top end of the most fertile growing ground in the country, we don't have enough growing soil going forward. We don't have enough water falling out of the sky going forward. We have a diminishing workforce that we, we can't get to get the products to market even if they can be grown. So I think CEA does help solve a lot of those things, or it provides some answers. Open ground farming in Salinas Valley and, and San Joaquin Valley certainly isn't going away today or tomorrow, but is it sustainable long term? Mm -hmm. it's, no. Okay, well, so in the interest of time, we're going to wind this down. Um, I'm going to give each of you a chance to share one thing uh, that you'd like to, take, to have the group take away, uh, and then Edmund, I'll come to you, and then I'll finish out. So um, Greg, would you like to go first? What's the one thing that you'd like to share with the group? So there's a lot of messages out there that we want to get to the, the customers. There's obviously you know, so many different versions of customers, and, and we want to make everybody happy, which we strive to do every day, and it's, it's nearly impossible. And there's all these messages. And you know, one of my favorite things about produce is the produce. <laughs> it's literally the produce, yet we have all these messages that we have to convey to folks. And you know, we have the packaging, all that stuff. What, what can we do? How, how do we keep the, the, the fresh looking fresh? Well, getting those messages, and, and is that, you know, where maybe we get a different message in, in every case. Maybe it's a flip where this one's a vitamin C message. This one's a, you know, socially responsible message. So we're not littering, the, you know, the, the, the produce with, with messages. All important, obviously we have the digital component where we can reach anybody in any digital channel, but I, I think that's, uh, that's what I, I would leave the message. And one thing that came to mind really quick was that when I was in the store with my daughter, I think they used to ask for candy bars. She did one of those shots, just like right there. And I'm just like, no, that doesn't speak to, to, to you know, the different customers. It's not candy bars anymore. It's, it's those functional things. It's all those things that, that people, uh, you know, they know. Like you're saying, the dollar, that's great. So much good information. You like the about. produce in the produce. I like yeah. that. That's I do. Nice he's going to be selling t-shirts outside. And if yeah. he's not, uh, next uh, year. Yeah. Michael, yeah. you got anything? The thing what's I like your, what's your, about produce is the produce. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Michael, your, your one thing? <laughs> I, I, really, I really still think it's going to be exciting. The, the, the opportunity to, to engage our customer no longer happens on the sales floor in the department. It's got tentacles. We are going to be able to reach them so many different ways. You know, not geofencing, but, you know, certainly through all kinds of different, different platforms, mm -hmm. social and otherwise. I mean, yeah. 
uh, I had to put TikTok on my phone because I had to find out about tomato and feta pasta, right? That's, that's real, and we're gonna be able to meet our customer on so many different levels than we, we have before, and that, those are opportunities. Those levels are all opportunities. That's great. Edmund? Yeah, I wanna, I wanna thank um, these guys for being part of this panel. I mean, I've known Walter for a long time, so when he asked me to come up, I was like, yeah, I can fake it with Walter any time. But <laughs> these guys, in like just a couple hours, we've had incredible conversations, and, and uh, I just, you know, I, I'm, I love produce, produce, right? I love produce, I love produce guys, and these guys have been great. Um, and I also want to appreciate Walter because he's been the mentor of my uh, career. So, um, but I do want to speak to the genesis of of the organic movement. It started with advocacy, and it was deeply rooted in there. And and we had our biggest success, our biggest growth, when we combined advocacy with guidance, when we guided the consumer. I think that's a really important sort of back to the future message that I'd love to impart on you guys to take away with you. We have a responsibility and we need to go out. It's no longer just servicing what the customer wants. We've got to help the customer find what's the best thing for them. Um, and I also want to, I mean, John spilled my thunder a little bit, but I want to make a call out to the organic community, the organic growers, the organic farmers, the organic producers. I think for 40 years, you've shown incredible leadership in forming this industry and, and creating a, a marketplace for a really highly ethical market. Um, I, think, I think you've provided us with a language and you've provided us with a roadmap to kind of become really excellent retailers. Uh, 40 years ago, I wouldn't have seen sitting in a room like this having this kind of a high-level conversation about the future of food. It, it's going to make the world, and you guys are responsible for making the world a better place. It's the core with which to build it on. Great. Okay. I would certainly echo that. I think that the, uh, all the producers in the room, uh, there's a lot of work ahead, but um, so much has happened and you've, you've shown what's possible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read in closing just the uh, summary statement that Karen Christensen, who was going to be here from Whole Foods, prepared because I think it really encapsulates really this whole opportunity to meet the customer where they are and where we are right now. So bear with me because we couldn't get it up on slide, but uh, here we go. Grocery retail is more dynamic than ever. Omnichannel shopping patterns are here to stay. We are bullish that physical stores will continue to anchor the retail grocery experience. We are equally convinced that digital channels present an opportunity for ongoing innovation and personalization that give consumers what they want, when they want it, across a variety of platforms. There's a new generation of consumers emerging. I think that the customer expectations for transparency and proactive solutions will only grow as we move forward. We've spoken a lot about that today. I'm excited to see the producer community step up and take on responsibility in this space. Whether it's through new technologies or traditional production methods, the produce industry has a massive platform to drive positive change. The work that you're doing to improve food security, reduce food waste, reduce and improve packaging, to improve labor conditions and reduce climate impacts is essential. And our collective ability, that includes all of us as retailers, our collective ability to authentically share that with the customers is a baseline expectation at this point. So with that, I'll say thank you all very much for, your, for being with us today and being, bearing with us. And uh, thanks to our panelists for your time. Thank you. thank you for attending the Organic Produce Summit 2022 educational and keynote sessions. In less than one hour, the sold-out expo floor will open to networking opportunities with more than 150 of the leading organic companies in North America. But first, lunch is a great time to start the conversation. Sponsored by Homegrown Organics and Nature Fresh Farms, volunteers are ready to show you to the Custom House Plaza. Enjoy and have a great afternoon.